have the dilemma that we are asked to sing the song of, uh, that we haven't sung before, something that's new, that has not been part of our expression for eons of existence. Perhaps never. Because, you know, if you look back at what we would just um, term the Garden of Eden, um, although we understand Garden of Eden was actually referred to as a place here that was a genetic library that star seeds created, the, the Garden of Eden is really a state of being. The pristine origins of where we were, when, when the, we were self-sustaining because we were at one with the ocean. A river needs to be fed because it's separate from the ocean. A river in the ocean, which is really what a current is, it's automatically fed. And so when we were currents in the ocean, what we looked at at that time was really expression um, like a cartoon that hadn't been filled in. We are capable of deeper expression now, so it is possible that these things that we need to express to bring these races back have never been expressed by us before. Now, I also understood, because I told Nur, I said, look honey, if all else fails, I'd like you to go to a really good homeopath that has a doctorate in homeopathy that actually will treat the, the core issues, because he's brilliantly identified these issues, clearly somebody who's worked on himself. So, you know, once you identify the core issue, uh, you know, mine were threefold, and they normally are threefold, and, and one was certainly the shame of humanness, the, the not understanding, which is so much better for me now, that you've assisted with giving me insights on food, for example, but I had shame that I had to eat or sleep or go to the bathroom or sneeze or cough or whatever it was. Um, this, the other one for me was that people don't understand what I'm trying to say, but there is a handful that can even under comprehend the bit that I'm saying when it's endless. And and for the most part, a lot of people come to my classes, they're cerebrally taken in, they sit down and take notes, they never look at the notes again, and they don't try and incorporate it into their life and integrate it as something they live. It's like I've had my fix, and now it's, I'll see you again next year. In the meantime, I go here, I go there, I look somewhere else, or, you know, I'm good till you come back again. But there isn't the, the hard work that actually isn't hard if you realize that these things are a path of complete and utter joy. But, so, the, the dilemma, so the homeopathy often helps to bring up these, these core issues for you to look at. Um, there's a homeopathic way for us to deal with this. And it, it is so helpful. What is a, a homeopathy? Well, homeopathy is a little different than the oils. See, those oils are not just oil. They are specifically, some of them we have taken, like the sandalwood, we have sent back, sent back, sent back, sorry, it's, the frequency is just not right, until finally the sandalwood is perfect. The rose, same thing. We had to mix percentages of Damascan rose, Moroccan rose, Egyptian rose, till it was just perfect. But they remind you of oneness. They remind of the oneness. The, on the other hand, something that is homeopathic often is something that introduces a tiny bit of what you had, almost like a vaccination, a tiny bit of that which is traumatic, so that your body can cope with it and say, you know what, I've been there, done that on a small scale, I don't need to deal with it on a big scale. It's a way in which disease is treated. Um, before it even begins. A, a very bad example would be vaccinations. The vaccinations, you know, I've, I had to have my daughter vaccinated to get her out of Canada into America, but never again. Um, you know, everywhere they ask for her vaccinations, I say conscientious objector because of how bad it is and how multi-generational vaccinations weakens humanity. Um, but the, the the concept of it, where you introduce a little bit of the bad, 
almost like a like a, a way that your body can cope with it on a small scale, then it's immune on a big scale, is what I'm, I'm aiming at. Um, Ronnie yesterday asked me, I mean, why do we have to look at these horrible things of our past? It's like going into this horrible cesspool. Can't we just move forward? And we have tried it, haven't we? We've worked for how many years on ourselves? And then just when we least expect it, it pulls another string. Mm -hmm. So what, what I'm going to suggest is twofold. Today, we're going to make a long outing. I have taken stock of all the leftovers and I have prepared three dishes out of it that Cesar is going to put together in the form of big salads. We're taking corn off the corn cobs, the quinoa, everything, you know, <coughs> putting it together into food so that we'll come back by two o'clock. And by two, there should be some nice big salads on the table for you to eat. I just decided this this morning just when I saw that if we sat here, it would be with dire distress that we go back and look at those things. But if we were out on the land, it can be done easier because it's electric and we can ground it. This is the secret of looking back at your past. Now, let's answer Ronnie's question. See, what is the past? The past is, in, without any doubt, a psychic impression that has been left. If it is very vital emotion that is still present in you, you could call it a ghost, because a ghost is a little bit different than a psychic impression. It has more awareness of what's going on around it. Um, you know, I, I remember once uh, um, seeing a, a horrible scene of, of Native American women wrapped in blankets that had pox in it and they, had, they were all stricken with, with pox and they were marching in a line, in a line. They were completely oblivious to the fact that I was there and they were walking across the land. They were not a ghost, they were a psychic impression. Once upon a time they walked there. They're in the spirit world right now but the impression of that event was so traumatic that it is still there. Now, see, Native Americans and indigenous people everywhere have an identity that they've created. And, oh, I share more of the Native American things that I say. It's not that I'm picking on them. It's that I, I want you to take back something useful for your people, my love. I love them dearly. Um, I love them because I see them in my daughter. It was the love of my life. Um, and I lived among them. I, I know their hearts. <coughs> they look back at the pain because it's more cathartic than not looking back. It's more helpful to the psyche than just pretending it didn't happen. The, Ar the Armenians have a situation where the Turks herded them over the edge of the cliff by the tens of thousands and have never acknowledged that they did it. And the heartache to them is that the world does not acknowledge that this genocide happened in 1910. And there's families lost, huge lineages lost. They've actually cataloged it. But the world doesn't want to deal with it. It's just another political thing we really don't want to look at. That is more painful than looking at it. But the problem is that if you just look at the pain, you start to identify with it. Now you are the victim in your psyche and you don't get beyond it. So if you should look at the pain, but you shouldn't look at the pain, so how exactly do you do that? Just like the vaccination or the, the way that the homeopathy works. You introduce a small bit that you can handle. You look at it, look at it, look at it till the emotion's gone. And then you have to put something in its place. I absolutely promise you there are no victims. And if something has happened to a nation, to a people, to a race, this is my grandmother's Bible. I'm happy to put it down here. I haven't for a long time. You can take a look at it. It's written in High Dutch. Um, she was in South Africa, 18 years old, when she got this at her confirmation in the Dutch Reformed Church, 18 years old. Two years later, she was in a British concentration camp. The numbers for 
sorry, I'm extremely emotional in this week. Everything is coming out since you're here. Um, the, the, the numbers are chilling. Again, something the British don't want to look at. They only managed to kill in the Boer War 2,000 of the Boer men, which were essentially Dutch. Only 2,000. Because it was the first war in which guerrilla warfare was being waged. They couldn't kill the men, so they killed the women. 20,000 women and children were killed. By the British? By the British. Oh. Only, they only managed 2,000. Till the Boers said, this is not worth it, we give up. And oh, big deal, you know, we conquered in the World War. So, everywhere you will look, you know, Af Afghanistan, you know, the, the Hebrew people, the Israeli people, Africa. every, oh, Africa, let's not forget, everywhere <clears throat> you look, indigenous peoples, but not only indigenous peoples, there is this history of trauma. So, if we can do this for ourselves, we can do this for them. This is the glory of working with the original creations, the highest consciousness beings in the cosmos. You clean the, the spot off the lens, you clean, clean the huge big thing out on the screen. You get the fly off the lens, you get the massive fly off the screen. If you just look at the screen you say, we can't fix this. Yes, you can. So here's how we're going to do it today. We're going to be on the land because the past is a, a ghost. A psychic impression. Um, for me to sit there and feel sad, which I did, horribly sad, at, at the, the psychic impression of these women wrapped in blankets because it's all they had, but it had smallpox um, um, germs on it and, and killed people off. Um, well, they may now be happily living somewhere else. They may have incarnated and have a beautiful home in Hawaii. And I'm still holding on to the past by being sad over it. It's like a television show. Look, we watch television shows of wars and this or that. Do we feel like it's real when we get all up? Well, if it's very violent, it violates us. But if it is something that, okay, this big sword play, nobody <coughs> sees much blood, you know, and, and okay, this side won, this side didn't. But you can see it's a staged movie for you. This is a movie for you. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going, we're going to actually make a little walkabout today. And we're going to be much in silence. The only time that you talk, please, is if you're trying to gather people back into your car. Um, we are going to, we are, I'll be sitting where you can see me, or standing, or wherever we are, where you can see me. So when I get up to go to the car, you know it's time for you to get up and go to the car. So you don't need to have watches. If we're grounding, do we walk with our shoes off? Um, you, if you just sit on the ground, mm -hmm. it's fine. Yeah. You know, especially something like like a cancer wearing is cotton. If you sit mm -hmm. with cotton, just this back from the the, uh, <coughs> it, it, the it goes up the spine. It's like a, a lightning rod, or you can be barefoot. So either one, you can lie on the ground. The, the psychic impression loses its electric charge, which holds us in place, when you are grounded when you do it. So I'm going to ask you, step one, we'll go to one location, and I'm going to ask you there to do your first assignment. And first assignment is that you simply know, I'm going to look at the big picture. So I'm going to take you to a lookout point. We're not going to start there more than 10 minutes. But you can just see for miles. They used that lookout point in the war, actually, um, to, to watch for, for submarines. Because you can see 180 degrees. I'm just going to take you there, and you're going to say, look. Look at the little waves. Okay, there might be a whale blowing over here. Look how small it looks when I look from the big picture. I'm going to look at a little bit of the trauma in my life, like a little shot of vaccine, but I'm going to look at it from the big picture until it no longer makes me want to cry or fear or angst or rage. Until the emotional charge is gone, I will look and look and look. Each time I'll come back, look again, look again, maybe different little scenes, but tiny little snippets. But I'm going to look at it from the big picture, and what that means is that before you do exercise two, which will take longer to do, 
Exercise one is just to remember, look at the big picture. Next we will go to a place where we can just sit next to the water. O has asked that he please be near water and so we're going to do that. Um, and so we're going to go next to the place where I'm going to ask you to remember yourself as everything that is. Now in Balvaspata you do that for yourself and you do that for your patient. You become everything. From there you look at a little, a little screen in front of you and look at little scenes from your life as though it's a really poorly written movie. Okay, just a bad movie. But you know what? I'm, I'm captive audience. I'm in the movie theater. I'll just watch. If it gets intense, flip forward to another little scene. If it gets too intense, go back to who you are right here and go out again and become the big picture all over again and let's do it again. But keep looking until it loses its hold on you. That is our second stop. And we're going to stay there maybe 45 minutes. Please dress warmly, take a blanket, pillow, anything you need. I don't quite know where exactly it will be yet. but So then we're going we're gonna to possibly go ocean, we're going to go to lake, we're going to go to the river up on the native reserve 20 minutes up north, and then possibly we'll end up coming back down to the beach and come home. Um, the, the next step after that is to say, okay, I've looked at this now. Do I really want to have any part of this movie back in my life? Any, because you're looking on either spots that weren't good, okay? You say, no, I, I really don't. It's like that button pushing that, uh, uh, Matteo is actually the one who asked about that. I mean, how do you know when it's a knee-jerk reaction? When you have a charge attached to it. You state your truth, but if there's no charge, it's not, it's a response. It's not a reaction. And you say, look, do I need to look any further at any of this? Not really. Been there, done that. This is getting boring. Step three is where you just release it. You say, I really don't want to do this again. If we're at the third stop and you've already just, okay, this is gone now, then what I would like you to do is to say, how can I put in my life that which I didn't have? What must I live to put it in place? See, and then you start to, to imagine your life, but go beyond where you're currently expressing. That's the fourth stop. That's the fourth stop thing that we'll be doing. Once you've released, you know, once you've gone to the big vision, then you've looked at it like a TV movie, just little snippets without emotion. If there's emotion, you keep going back until there's no emotion. Third stop is that you say, okay. Do I really want any part of this silly movie that is not even real? It's on a television screen made of building blocks, which has a beginning and an end. I'm an eternal being. Do I really need any of this more? When you let it go, the next step, whether you're on spot three or spot four, is how am I going to sing in my life? What am I going to do to make my life sing? Um, so is anyone writing this down?